Welcome to our online service today. Wherever you are or whoever you are, you are very, very welcome indeed. It's not the same as meeting together in person, but in these difficult times, we can at least have a sense of worshipping together. Towards the end of the psalm that we've just seen, David, who has poured out his soul in confession to God, cries out, O oh Lord, give me the words, then my mouth will praise you. The Book of Common Prayer uses that verse in a response. O oh Lord, open thou our lips. And the reply comes, and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. I don't know how you feel this week. Maybe like so many of us, praise doesn't come easily to our minds and to our lips in a pandemic and in lockdown. Maybe we're really struggling, juggling so many things, battling maybe with loneliness and even illness. And yet, as we saw in Isaiah 42 last week, God encourages us to join the whole of creation in praising him. But we need his help to do that. So, O oh Lord, give me the words, then my mouth will praise you. So let's pray and ask God to help us to praise him this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you as people who are hurting, people who are struggling. We need your help this morning. O oh Lord, give us the words so we can praise you today. Amen. What better way to begin by singing
pardon for sin and a peace that endureth, thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide, strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow, blessings all mine with ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness. The hymn reminds us of some very important truths. First of all, of course, that God offers forgiveness through the death of his son, Jesus. That's what David recognised in Psalm 51, that God is a God who forgives. But we need to come to God to acknowledge afresh that we desperately need to be forgiven. And we acknowledge that in the certain confidence that God does forgive us. So let's be still and quiet for a moment and then the words of our confession will come up on the screen as we join in those together. So let's just be still. And we pray together. O oh Lord, we cry to you from the depths of our being. Let your ears be open as we plead for mercy. If you kept a record of our sins, none of us could stand before you, but you alone can forgive us. Therefore, we come to you in awe. Lord, we wait for you, and in your promise we put our hope through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Knowing the assurance of God's forgiveness transforms our lives. Let's pray. Gracious Lord and Father, thank you for the forgiveness we know in Jesus. Thank you that by your Spirit you are present with us to cheer us, to guide us. Thank you that you promise strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow your blessings poured out upon us. And so we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's go and see what Bev's cats are doing today. And we might even see Bev as well. Good morning, everyone. I wonder, can you see Ridley's little face? Just inside inside the house. I know, he's staying inside where it's nice and warm and dry. Uh, well, it's not too wet out here, and so today I have been out and about with Granny Bev. Granny Bev, will this save me? Oh, yes, dear. Will it save me forever and ever? No, dear. Granny Bev, will these gloves save me? From cold hands, yes, dear. Will they save me forever and ever? No, dear. Granny Bev, will my wellies save me? From muddy feet, yes, dear. <laughs> will they save me forever and ever? No, dear. Granny Bev, will this save me? What have you got on your head, dearie? Will it save my head? Well, yes, it'll save your head when you're outside. Will it save me forever and ever? No, dear. So we see that God has given lots of people lots of excellent ideas like gloves for your hands and hats for your head and, and wellies for your feet. And these save us, but they don't save us forever and ever. There is only one thing that saves us forever and ever. And that is a person, a person called Jesus. So when we look at all these things that save us just for a little bit, we can say, thank you, Lord, for the things that keep my head warm, that keep me set, my body safe, that keep my feet from getting wet and muddy. 
We can say thank you, Lord. But we also need to say thank you and accept the gift that is going to save us forever and ever. And that's Jesus. And if you put your trust in Jesus, if you recognize that you don't deserve to be with him forever because your heart is against him, and you turn to Jesus and you say, thank you, Jesus, for dying in my place on the cross, then you'll be hit with him forever and ever. And that is our salvation. And so this is the verse. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. That's Acts 4 verse 12. So let's say God's word says together. God's word says, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Acts chapter 4 verse 12. And why do we get offered this salvation? Because God's love is very, very big and very, very high. So we're going to sing about God's love that is wider than the ocean. So let's sing now. Every year, the organisation Open Doors publishes what it calls the World Watch List. It's a list of the 50 countries around the world where it is most difficult to be a Christian because of the levels of persecution. The World Watch List for 2021 was published just about a week and a half ago. And we're going to watch a short video that tells us a little bit about the pressures on Christians in those countries that face the greatest persecution. And then we're going to pray for those Christians and for other issues together. So let's watch the video first. What if your church had to meet in secret? What if spies watched your every move? What if following Jesus meant you faced violence or even death? Millions of Christians around the world experience these kinds of challenges every day. And these are the top 10 countries where faith costs the most. Number 10, India. Hindu extremists want to rid India of Christians and they are prepared to use extreme violence to achieve their goal. At number nine, Nigeria, where more Christians are murdered for their faith than in any other country in the world. Iran is at number eight. Secret house churches risk being raided by the police. If caught, be prepared for a long prison sentence. Number seven, Yemen. A war-torn country where Christians, if discovered, face the death penalty. Eritrea is at number six. If your faith is discovered, you can be imprisoned without trial in appalling conditions. Often, your loved ones don't even know if you're still alive. Number five, Pakistan. Say the wrong thing in Pakistan and the notorious blasphemy laws could see you accused of insulting Islam and sentenced to death. At number four is Libya. 
a lawless land with no freedom of speech or belief. Somalia is number three on the list. Somali Christians can't reveal their faith to anyone or they could be killed, even by their own families. Number two is Afghanistan. If they find out you're a Christian, you have a stark choice. Flee the country or be killed. And at number one, North Korea, the most dangerous place in the world to be a Christian. Informants are everywhere. Discovery means death, either by execution or by being worked to death in a labor camp. At least 340 million Christians around the world experience high levels of persecution and discrimination. What if you could help them? For 65 years, Open Doors has stood alongside the persecuted church, strengthening Christians who dare to follow Jesus, no matter the cost. Your prayers and gifts enable our underground networks to reach millions of Christians with emergency food and aid, spiritual care, smuggled Bibles and Christian books, training and legal advice. But more than that, your support means that persecuted Christians know that they are not forgotten, not alone. After all, these are not strangers and they are not statistics. They are our brothers and sisters and they need our help. So let's pray together. We'll begin by praying for our brothers and sisters around the world facing persecution for their faith in Jesus. The letter to the Hebrews in the New Testament says, continue to remember those in prison as if you yourself were with them in prison, and those who are ill-treated as if you yourselves were suffering. Let's pray. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, your Son Jesus experienced suffering and death for us on the cross. And you remind us that everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And so we want to pray for our brothers and sisters around the world facing persecution today because they trust in Jesus. We bring to you the reality that levels of persecution are rising in many countries and that the COVID pandemic has brought new forms of discrimination against Christians by governments and neighbours. And we pray for protection, but we also pray for strength and perseverance in the face of opposition. We lift to you the families of those who have been killed this past year and ask that you would comfort them in their loss, but also that you would take away the fear that they may be experiencing for their own lives. We pray for the governments of many nations who pass legislation that persecutes Christians, especially India, China, North Korea. We pray that they would seek the prosperity and welfare of all citizens whatever faith they may proclaim. And rather than promoting persecution, they would see their role under God to protect citizens. We thank you for the work of Open Doors and other organisations as they support believers around the globe. And we pray that we as individuals and as a church would take seriously the command to support Christians whose lives are blighted by persecution and discrimination. And we ask it to the glory of your name. Amen. Our verse for the year comes from Isaiah 40 and it speaks of the Lord in these terms. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. For those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. 
Heavenly Father, we're so conscious of the pressures many people are facing during this latest lockdown in the UK. And we pray for those who are struggling at the moment. We pray for families, balancing work, homeschooling and caring for children. We pray for our doctors, nurses and all in the medical profession, some experiencing increased pressure in hospital, others working long hours as they carry out vaccinations. We pray for our teachers, maintaining online learning and lessons for pupils in school. For our students as they come to the end of the exam period and face a return to online lectures. We pray for those in the workplace, especially those who've been furloughed and those who have lost their jobs and those struggling to keep their business afloat. And we pray for those who are facing loneliness and other challenges. Gracious Father, we pray that you will give strength to the weary, keeping each one of us walking closely with you this week. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And we join together in the Lord's Prayer, which will appear on the screen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. We're going to sing a song that picks up a number of the themes from our prayers. When trials come, no longer fear, for in the pain our God draws near to fire a faith worth more than gold. And there his faithfulness is told.
Dave is going to read from Isaiah for us. But it may be that you're trying to cope during this service by caring for children. Uh, we know how difficult that can be. Well, so maybe you want to press the pause button now and come back to hear the reading and the sermon later on when you can concentrate more. For the rest of us, let's have our Bible reading from Isaiah 42 onwards. Our reading is Isaiah chapter 42 verse 18 to chapter 43 verse 13. Isaiah 42, 18 to 43, 13. Hear, you deaf, look, you blind, and see. Who is blind but my servant, and deaf like the messenger I send? Who is blind like the one in covenant with me, Blind like the servant of the Lord. You have seen many things, but you pay no attention. Your ears are open, but you do not listen. It pleased the Lord for the sake of his righteousness to make his law great and glorious. But this is a people plundered and looted, all of them trapped in pits or hidden away in prisons. They have become plunder. With no one to rescue them, they have been made loot. With no one to say, send them back. Which of you will listen to this, or pay close attention in time to come? Who handed Jacob over to become loot, and Israel to the plunderers? Was it not the Lord against whom we have sinned? For they would not follow his ways, they did not obey his law. So he poured out on them his burning anger, the violence of war. It enveloped them in flames, yet they did not understand. It consumed them, but they did not take it to heart. But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour. I give Egypt for your ransom, Cush and Seba in your stead. Since you are precious and honoured in my sight, and because I love you, I will give people in exchange for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar, and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called, be my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Lead out those who have eyes but are blind, who have ears but are deaf. All the nations gather together, and the peoples assemble. Which of their gods foretold this and proclaimed to us the former things? Let them bring in their witnesses to prove they were right, so that others may hear and say, it is true. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and apart from me there is no Saviour. 
I have revealed and saved and proclaimed. I am not some foreign God among you. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, that I am God. Yes, and from ancient days I am he. No one can deliver out of my hand. When I act, who can reverse it? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What is the point of continuing to believe in a God who does not make any difference to my life? When our circumstances are so difficult, how can we keep trusting God? When we're now in our third lockdown, the vaccination is still a long way off for most of us, and there's growing concern about new variants of the virus, how can we keep trusting God? When a young woman, only recently married, lies unresponsive in a hospital bed, how can we keep trusting God? When a beautiful baby, less than a year old, has to undergo chemotherapy treatment for cancerous growths in both her eyes. How can we keep trusting God? This was the question faced by the Israelites in exile in Babylon. And for them, it was a very real question, just as it is for us. The exile was to last 70 years. The average life expectancy at that time was between 35 and 40 years, which means that two generations would live their entire lives in exile and die in exile. It would have been all too understandable for them to think, where are the promises of God? Where is God's faithfulness? How could they go on trusting him? What was the point of continuing to believe in a God who did not make any difference to their life? There is only ever one way of responding to such a question as this. Only one place to look for the answer, and that is to look to God. And this is what here in chapters 42 and 43 of Isaiah, the prophet helps Israel to do to look to God. And before the eyes of his dispirited, discouraged, confused and struggling people, Isaiah holds the glory of God. He shows them the righteousness of God's justice, the wonder of God's love, the supremacy of God's power and the certainty of God's faithfulness. And if this is the question to which we seek the answer today, it is these four things that we need to see. Firstly, the righteousness of God's justice. In chapter 41 and verse 8, God calls Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen. And then, as we saw last week, in chapter 42 and verse 1, he says of his servant, Here is my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom I delight. Could Israel be this servant, the one in whom God delights, chosen to establish justice on the earth? Well, two things make for a good servant. Eyes to see what needs doing, and ears to hear when their master calls. And what does Isaiah say of Israel in verse 19? Who is blind but my servant, and deaf like the messenger I send? They may have seen many things, but they paid no attention. Their ears may be open, but they do not listen. Yes, Israel was supposed to be this servant, but they are blind to what needs doing 
and deaf to the call of God to be obedient to his great and glorious law. And so they find themselves in exile in Babylon, exactly as God had promised in his law. In Leviticus chapter 26 and Deuteronomy chapter 28. Because they refuse to see and hear and obey, God drives them out of the land, just as he had warned them that he would do. Instead of establishing justice on earth, justice is settled on them. The righteousness of God's justice. If you are not a believer listening this morning, this is a hard truth. But God has not changed. And through his word in the Bible, he tells you, that at the end of your life, you will face his perfect justice. If you are a believer listening this morning, you know what anyone can know. Anyone who will receive the gift that God is offering them. That God's righteous justice has already fallen, not on you, but for you on his Son, Jesus Christ, who has taken its penalty in your place. You know that you no longer need have any fear of God's judgment, of his punishment, because Jesus has taken it for you. For all people listening this morning, believers and non-believers alike, God's actions in our lives now, particularly the hard things, are not his judgment in this ultimate sense. Rather, they are his discipline, designed, as verse 25 tells us, to open our eyes to see his reality, perhaps for the first time or more clearly designed to unstop our ears, to hear his call, perhaps for the first time, or more distinctly. The justice, the justice he pours on us now, verse 25, is not to do away with us, but to help us to understand, to give us the chance to take these truths to heart, so that you, believer, might repent more fully of what you have done and might rejoice more fully in what Jesus has done for you. And so that you, non-believer, might turn to him and receive the rescue that he offers you while there is still time to do so before his righteous judgment finally falls the righteousness of God's judgment, God's justice. But then, as chapter 43 opens, it's as if the clouds lift and the sun breaks through. I wonder what you would say is the most astounding word in the Bible. Well, we could make a very good case for it being the word, but. Can you hear it ring out in chapter 43, verse 1? But now. There's another wonderful example of exactly this in Romans chapter 3 and verse 21. But now. It is a signal of a complete and wonderful change of direction. But now. This is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. The wonder of God's love. God's discipline, even his judgment of Israel in exile, is not the end. 
unchangeably rebellious against him though they are, he remains totally committed to them. They are his. Look at what he has done for them, verse 3. He has rescued them from Egypt. He gave Egypt as the ransom price for their freedom. And look at what he will do for them in verse 2. He will preserve them, even in exile. When you pass through the waters, the waters of my judgment, into exile, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. Yes, we may experience God's discipline in our lives now. And at times it may be a stern discipline, but it will not overcome us. It is not designed for that. For God has something far greater in store for his people Israel. Verse 5. A day is coming when he will call his people out of exile and bring them to himself. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. And God does not change. This is what he is offering anyone who will hear his call today and respond to it. <clears throat> A day is coming when this present exile, with all its difficulties and challenges, will be ended. And he will bring us to himself. But why? How? Why does God remain so utterly committed to such rebellious people as us? There is only one reason, and it comes in verse 4. You are precious and honoured in my sight, and because I love you. God loves rebellious people like us. We are precious to him, honoured by him. It is almost too wonderful to grasp. <clears throat> One commentator on these words says, people who are loved like that have absolutely nothing to fear. The wonder of God's love. <clears throat> but how is Israel to believe this? How are we to believe it when life is so unremittingly hard? When there seems to be no evidence, where is the evidence we need in order to believe or to go on believing? And so in verses 8 to 13, Isaiah takes them to the place where evidence is examined in a court of law and there shows them the supremacy of God's power. Lead out those who have eyes but are blind, who have ears but are deaf. Israel is brought into the court to witness the proceedings, but not just Israel. The whole world must hear this evidence, verse 9. All the nations gather together and the peoples assemble. And the proceedings begin. God is on trial. He will represent himself. And first he cross-examines all the gods of the peoples of the world, verse 9. Which of their gods foretold this? That Israel, a nation of defeated slaves, would be set free from slavery to Egypt the greatest superpower the world had ever seen. 
Let them bring in their witnesses to prove they were right, so that others may hear it and say, it is true. But there is silence in the court. There are no witnesses, because no other God exists to have done such a thing. And so God calls his own witnesses to prove the supremacy of his power. In a moment of high drama, he points across the courtroom to the benches for the members of the public up in the balcony to blind and deaf Israel. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord. It is Israel, constantly rebellious Israel, whose very existence bears incontrovertible witness to the supremacy of God's power. And so God makes his closing remarks to the court in verse 10. Before me, no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and apart from me, there is no saviour. No other God has done what God has done. No other God has hung on a cross to set his people free. If we are his today, by our very lives, we are his witnesses, witnesses to his power to defeat sin and set people free. And so the verdict is pronounced, verse 13, reading from the end of verse 12. I am God, yes, and from ancient of days, I am he. No one can deliver out of my hand. When I act, who can reverse it? the supremacy of God's power. More than 700 years later, the Apostle Paul would utter words which echo these words of Isaiah. Isaiah said, when I act, who can reverse it? Paul says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Isaiah said, no one can deliver out of my hand. Paul says, nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. In the supremacy of God's power lies the certainty of our protection. Whatever we may face in this life, however long it may last, if we are his, nothing will be able to separate us from him. And then finally, Isaiah shows them the certainty of God's faithfulness. Don't just look back at what God has done in the past, he says in verse 18. Glorious though it was, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. Instead, remember, God is the same yesterday, today and forever. He does not change. And so expect him to act in these same ways in the future. Verse 19, see, I am doing a new thing. On a future day, he will do to Babylon what he did to Egypt, defeat his enemies, and so set his people free. Verse 14, for your sake, I will send to Babylon and bring down as fugitives all the Babylonians. On a future day, he will do for Israel what he did for their fathers, preserve them in the barren wilderness and bring them to their home, verses 19 and 20. I am making a way 
in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. I provide water in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen. On a future day, he will keep his promise. He will fulfill his great eternal purpose, verse 21, to form for himself a people who will declare his praise. We cannot make sense of what happens to us in this broken world if we try to do so only in terms of this broken world. If we insist on answers now, if we insist on resolution now, we may be badly disappointed. We may even come to a point where we have to stop walking with God. But God is doing something far bigger than simply making things better now, much as we would long that he would do so. No, he has bigger plans for us. He is bringing us to himself. He is preparing a place for us, with him, for all eternity. And he is preparing us for that place. No matter how hard the road God asks us to walk, no matter how long the journey may last, even if God would have it be an entire lifetime, as it was for two whole generations in Babylon, we can be absolutely sure that he will keep his word. He will do a new thing. He will bring us to himself, the certainty of God's faithfulness. What is the point in continuing to believe in a God who does not make any difference to my life. What is the point? The point is this. Look with me at chapter 43 and verse 7. We were created for his glory. And look at verse 10. We were chosen to be his witnesses. And at verse 21, we were formed to proclaim his praise. We were created and chosen and prepared to testify to the glory of our great God, his justice and love and power and faithfulness. This is why we exist this is why we are here on this earth, in all circumstances, to praise the greatness of our God. Not just to one another, although certainly to one another, for his glory and our encouragement, but also to those who are yet still blind and deaf. Let us praise God to them in their sight and in their hearing, praying always that God will open their eyes to see his glory in the face of Jesus Christ, that he will unstop their ears to hear the message so that faith might come, that he might bring them to himself and that they, together with us, might declare his praise. Let's pray. Our Father, we acknowledge the rightness of your justice. We rejoice in the wonder of your love. We rest in the supremacy of your power over this broken world. And we trust in the certainty of your faithfulness. Now, Father, give us courage not to keep these things to ourselves, but to share them with others. 
to the praise of your name. Amen. We've come to the end of our service today. Immediately after the service, do stay on and learn a new song with our musicians. Uh, you can log on any time during the week to hear the song again, so that we're all ready to sing it together next Sunday. And do make contact with others. We're all struggling together in these difficult times. And so let's encourage one another, maybe with a quick phone call, or a WhatsApp message, or a card in the post. God uses his people as the means by which he brings encouragement. And so he wants me and you to be involved in that during this week. So let's pray as we close. May the Lord guide us and restore his comfort to us. May the Lord bring praise to our lips and send us peace wherever we are. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with us now and always. Amen.
Either.